This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is an award-winning actor, writer, and producer. He created, wrote, and starred as the neurotic Nathan Adler in the groundbreaking hit TV series, Old Dogs and New Tricks, which ran for five seasons on Amazon Prime. He's also appeared in other TV shows, including The Law and Mr. Lee, and the miniseries Brave New World. His feature film credits include Open, Final Remains, Hot Guys with Guns, Mortuary, and Some Prefer Cake, in addition to dozens of short films, including Deer Season, The Apple Tree, Allegiance, Zero Tolerance, Paramedic, Awake, and many more. On the stage, our guest has appeared in many theatrical productions, including portraying the iconic Quentin Crisp in two productions of Jeffrey Hartgrave's stage hit, Carved in Stone. He's also appeared in Message to Michael, Dream Boy, Thief River, Scheme of Things, Salsa Saved the Girls, and Last Sunday in June, which he wrote, and Setting the Record Gay, which he co-wrote and in which he played himself. In 2020, our guest published a frank and delightful memoir entitled Celebrity: The Queer Life of a Showbiz Footnote, which became an Amazon bestseller. And now he's released his insightful and entertaining new book entitled Expletives Not Deleted, in which he tackles such thorny subjects as cancel culture, modern technology, aging, overindulgent parenting, social yeah. media, racism, and the challenges of being an openly gay actor in Hollywood. He's been a columnist for Backstage Magazine, and his writings have also appeared in the Huffington Post, the San Francisco Examiner, and the Human Prospect Journal. I'm <clears> delighted <throat> to welcome Leon Acor to our show. Leon, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Harvey, thank you so much for having me. I'm exhausted hearing that intro. <laughs> My gosh. Well, you did all that. <clears throat> yeah, I'm old. <laughs> You wrote that you sometimes feel like a grumpy old queen when you think about your life. Why? You know, life has changed so much since, you know, the 70s and the 80s. You know, it seems like everything has flipped. You know, it used to be pot was illegal and everyone smoked cigarettes. Now everyone's smoking pot and God forbid you smoke cigarettes. You used to like not get into cars with strangers and that's now how we get, how we get around town you know it seems like all the old rules have have changed and i i'm adjusting but not as quickly as maybe i should i'm resisting a lot you wrote that if you could have chosen your sexual orientation you would have chosen to be gay not straight which is so interesting because i've always felt that straights have a much easier life than us don't you think you know i used to think that but lately i'm not sure if that's the case. I don't want to get too maudlin, but I mean, the suicide rates for straight white men are, are skyrocketing. I think, I mean, it's not easy to be gay, but I think it's maybe not easy to be straight anymore because you have to, you know, you're expected to be the tough guy, but your wife wants you to show emotion, but you're not supposed to do that. There's just so many um, mixed messages when you're a straight guy that you're supposed to be this, but not that, but be this, but not that where I find being gay, you kind of, you can, you know, we grow up making our own rules and defining who we are. So I think that ultimately gives us kind of a freedom that uh, maybe straight men don't have. An interesting perspective. Now you've always been an openly gay actor. How hard is it today in this day and age for gay actors in Hollywood to come out? I th well, it's certainly easier. I think it's easier now to, you know, most actors achieve some level of success before coming out. I think that's become much easier. I think it's still difficult to be open and out from the beginning, you know. I kind of, in a sick way, admire those actors who can, like, keep their mouth shut until they, like, you know, get five figures in the, the bank account <laughs> before they um, come clean. My thing is, I just, I think that's why I relate so much to Quentin Crisp. I felt like, for me... Passing was never a choice. I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm out there and it's kind of hard to deny it. But it's, think I think it's, it's, it's easier now, certainly, than it was when I started out. And, you know, <clears throat> when I started out, I actually had a gay, uh, not a gay, I had a casting director 
tell me I was too gay for commercials. This was like in the early 90s. And now, I mean, you see gay couples in commercials quite frequently. So we've come a long way and still have a ways to go. Do you think gay actors have a responsibility to come out and to be role models? I, you know, I think they do. I, I can see the arguments for the other side, but my feeling is that, is that actors are sort of like politicians in a way. We're representing segments of society. And it's, on the, you know, I can see the argument that, you know, it's your business and I'm certainly not for outing, but I think if you can be out, I mean, the show business is one of the most liberal industries in the world, despite some, you know, right wing fringes. If you can't be out in showbiz, where can you be out? Now, you're a highly experienced actor, Leon. You've had over 60 roles in theater and films, and you've had a successful TV series. And as you know, nowadays, there are more TV channels and streaming platforms than ever before, producing thousands of shows. And yet every actor tells me it's become harder than ever to get work. Why is that? There's so many reasons. It's like homelessness. There's no one cause. I think part of it is the whole new trend now of self-taping auditions. I think it really does a disservice to, you know, in the old days, you would like actually go to a casting director's office, you'd meet them, you'd kibitz, you'd chat, you know, they'd, they'd get a feeling for you. And now with everybody taping their auditions and sending them in via email or whatever, you're not even guaranteed that the casting director is going to see your work, you know, and much less, you know, they're not going to be able to connect with you or get a feel for you. Or, you know, in the old days, if you were like, maybe not right for this part, you would make an impression so that the next part that came along that you were right for, they'd remember you. And I don't, I don't think that's happening in this brave new world of self tape, but yeah, you know, it's funny. I always thought, Oh my God, with, streaming exploding on all these TV channels, there'd be more opportunities, which I guess there are. I don't know why it's not trickling down. I don't know. That's It's a really good question. Yeah, it seems to be the prevailing view among every actor I've had on this show that self-taping is not a plus, it's a minus, yeah. and that getting work seems to be so much harder because there's just so much competition. It's so hard to stand out. Yeah. Well, I think actually that's another good point. You know, it used to be in the day you wanted to be an actor or you didn't. Nowadays, it seems like everybody just wants to be famous, you know, using social media and becoming influencers. So it's a lot of the lines have blurred. There are a lot more people, I think, in the business now trying to to make it. But the nice thing about technology is this, you can also do it yourself if you want it bad enough which is kind of what we did with old dogs and new tricks and, and, you know, self-publishing books. You can, um, you don't have to wait for someone to do it for you or to offer it to you. You can just do it. Well, I'm a good example of that. I mean, I wanted to be a talk show host and created this show and ended up, you know, we're number 12 in the world now. So it is true that you, you don't need a big studio behind you. You can just do it yourself. Now, it's true. And I want to congratulate you on your success. It's really, it's fabulous to watch how your show has taken off. Oh, thank you so much, Leon. Now, one of the reasons I really wanted you on the show is because you've portrayed my all-time favorite gay icon, Quentin Crisp, mm. twice in your career mm. so far. What would you say you admired about him the most? His philosophy. You know, he's kind of, rightly so, thought of as kind of this uh, this wit and this... He's He's a philosopher. Most people don't give him credit for that. Some of his... My favorite part of, I mean, I enjoyed playing him, but my favorite part of that process was doing the research and doing all the reading. His, his, he's quite a writer. So much of his philosophy about, you know, not, not competing with the Joneses, you know, that uh, time is, I think my favorite is his saying that time is on the side of the outcast, that, you know, you just dig in and be yourself and sooner or later society will come to you. And that's, I, it's true. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I think we're both living examples of that, you know, if you just, if you're just yourself and pursue who you are and what you want, sooner or later people come to you. But yeah, there was just so much about him that I love, the philosophy. I love, the, he's, he's a great comedy writer. He's got this great way of, he saves the funny thing to the very end of the sentence or the very end of the paragraph. I've learned a lot from him. 
you know, as a writer, but I just admire his guts. He had the guts like, I got in the twenties to wear eyeshadow and nail polish in the 1920s. I mean, the word trans hadn't even been, you know, dreamed up yet. He was really brave. And um, I think that's what I admire most about him, that he's just, he's, he's an individualist unapologetically. And I just, I think that's so powerful and, and meaningful. And, you know, we need that in, in today's world. Well, you know, I find it so interesting that you mentioned Quentin's flair for comedic writing, because your books, Leon, have demonstrated that you have a real flair for comedic writing. And at one time, okay. you were invited to submit a writing sample to the Stephen Colbert show. Would you enjoy being a comedy writer for a TV show? You know, I think I would enjoy being a comedy writer for like a fictional, like a sitcom. That weekend when I was putting together that packet for Stephen Colbert, I was, oh my gosh, to have to, like, I was like going through Twitter, you know, they want you to, it has to be topical. It's, at that time, there was a, you know, you know who was still president, COVID was exploding. And it was really hard for me to find the comedy. I mean, I think I did, but it was, uh, my thing was like, if I had to do this every day and just like go into that cesspool looking for political sound bites, I, I think I would go mad. I really admire the people who do that. It's, it's boy, is it a skill and a talent, but um, I don't have that skill or talent. So got it. And my hat's off to them. In your new book, you gave us 10 reasons why getting older or aging gaily, as you call it, is a good thing. Do you feel there's something liberating about getting older and no longer having to work so hard to please other people? Oh, God, yeah. I mean, just the fact that life is calmer, that you're not scrambling. Like, but like most of my 20s, it was, you know, I was doing other things, but my main goal in life is like, okay, I, where am I going to get laid? You know, <laughs> which is crazy now when I think back to those days. Uh, but yeah, I'm really, life is kind of settled. I'm in a very happy, good marriage. Yeah, things do get better, as the old saying goes. I just, I, I'm really appreciating uh, uh, decreased urgency. You know, as you get older, you do kind of, I mean, I guess there are some older people who resist. And I think that one of the things that chapter goes into is that it's about accepting where you are. I compare it to like the seasons, you know, when it's November, December, you can complain about the cold and the, you know, the shorter days, or you can put on a sweater and have your pumpkin spice, whatever, and pull up to the fire and enjoy that time. It's really just perspective. And I'm, I'm really enjoying the perspective of, of life kind of being calmer, not feeling like you have to know it all and do it all that you, you kind of know who you are and you accept it. It's kind of nice. Just wait till you're all 60. You're going to love it. That's what I call serenity. I think you're expressing yeah. that you have attained a level of serenity, which I love. And another thing I loved, one of the most fun chapters in your book is a list of must-see classic movies that you feel every young gay man should see. I was very happy to see that you included Making Love on that list. We recently had Harry Hamlin on our show. <gasps> And he talked about the significance of that landmark film for the gay community. So thank you for bringing attention to that movie, Leon. It's, you know, it was a landmark, whether it, you know, is remembered today. At the time, it was a pretty big deal. It was really the, if not the first, one of the first major studio releases to have a gay, I mean, not even subtext, a gay text. And um, it was a big deal. I, I, we, we, we watched it during the pandemic. It could be better, but just the fact that it did what it did, I think it deserves a, a place in the pantheon of gay cinema. One very interesting thing about that movie that I learned from Harry is that it was the first movie that did better in home video rentals and purchases than it did in the theaters. People were afraid to go to the theater to watch it, but they rented yeah. it or bought it. You know, I saw it in a theater in Kokomo, Indiana, and it was about maybe half filled. I don't even know if the, the, most of the audience members knew what they were getting into, because when that scene came where they kissed for the first time, 
there was such an uh, uh, uproar in the theater. I thought the ceiling was going to come off. So I can understand people being, you know, it's like buying porn in a brown paper wrapper. You wait till you can take it home and watch it safely without someone seeing you at the theater. Now it seems really tame by today's standards, but um, at the time, yeah, it was like <sighs> shockingly gay. Well, I'm really, really glad you brought attention to it. And the other film that I was very happy to see on your list was Torch Song Trilogy, mm. which resonated with so many gay men like me whose parents had a very tough time accepting us. Did that movie really impact you on an emotional level? Not so much from the parental thing, because my parents, God love them, you know, they had the, the same journey as most parents have, but they made it a lot quicker than a lot of parents. I think that what resonated for me was... I really, I admire people who make their own rules and live their own lives unapologetically like Quentin Crisp. And I really loved uh, Harvey's character. He, that was him. He was just living his life the way he wanted to live it. And, you know, torpedoes be damned. I always admire that. That's why I admire actors who have always been out as opposed to the actors who come out later. I admire the individualists in the world. And yeah, I do too. Now, I know from reading your books that your favorite movie is Only When I Laugh. Tell ah. me why you love that movie so much. Oh, gosh. You know, at the time when I first saw this, it was like 1981. Marsha Mason, it's a Neil Simon based on his play, Gingerbread Lady, his serious play. And Marsha Mason plays this alcoholic, chain-smoking, tortured actress. And I was like, 17, 18, and I'm like, oh my God, that's what I want to be. I, you know, back then I thought to be an artist, you had to be tortured. You had to smoke, you had to drink, you had to just be self-destructive and self-indulgent. The thing that sticks with me about that movie is that it's really about friendship. You know, yes, the, the main story is about this woman uh, uh, reconciling with her daughter, but the, the background of it is her and her friendship with with her two best friends it's just it's and how they they're there for each other how they don't like dismiss each other when one or the other indulges in bad behavior i mean that's true friendship isn't it that you 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 know you can judge a little but you don't abandon that's what really has stuck stuck with me about that film. I still watch it about once a year. I have to be careful now because I don't smoke anymore and she makes smoking look like an art form. So <laughs> I can, you have to be really strong when I pull out that DVD and watch it now. That's a great movie. It's very funny and touching. I highly recommend it. At one point in your book, Leon, you lament what you called the frayed threadbare fabric of American society today. You refer to our divisive politics, lack of gun control, rabid social media, and the climate crisis, and you blamed racism, which you say was escalated when Obama became president. How do you explain the irony that a country that finally elected a Black president ended up becoming more openly racist as a result of it? I think it's because, you know, I grew up in Indiana, and there were a lot of what I call closet racists. People who, you know, were kind of kind of racist, but they don't, you know, they weren't joining the Klan. They wouldn't, they knew better than to say it out loud. I think when Obama was elected, it triggered a lot of those closet racists. You know, if a black man had moved in next door or had become their boss, they would have freaked out a little. But to have the commander in chief, the boss of all of us be a black man, I really do think it triggered a lot of racists who were closeted up until then to come out of the closet. I mean, remember all those horrible memes and things we saw after Obama was elected with, I mean, it was just so racist. And I think it empowered them. And then when you know who announced his candidacy, uh, they found their poster boy. And uh, I really feel like the racism is, is really the bedrock of that whole MAGA movement. It's... Uh, it's really frightening. I mean, I have to keep reminding myself that they are in the minority. There's, they're really only about 30 to 35% of American. Most Americans are smart. Most Americans are interested in democracy. I, I don't know how political you want to get here on your show. But um, yeah, I do think that, that that kind of underlying racism is really 
the cause of a lot of our troubles right now. So what do you think it's going to take to eliminate racism or at the very least make racists go back into hiding? I don't think we'll ever eliminate it. I mean, I think it's even the most enlightened of us, you know, will have moments of like, that's unfamiliar. I'm scared. Oh, no. Get over it. It's just because it's unfamiliar. That's why you're scared. Education is key. I think that's one of the reasons certain political party wants to kind of undercut education and to make people stupid. It's easier to control them that way. Uh, I think education, it's about one thing I always tell people, leave your hometown, travel. One of the best things I did was move to San Francisco when I was 21 and, and, and experiencing all the different cultures, the different accents, the different foods, the different races. It was enlightening. And I, I, I can understand why someone's a racist if they've never been exposed to anything but white people or never been exposed to anything except their own life experience. Get out there and experience it and you'll see that it's far less intimidating than we make it out when we're sitting in our hometown. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Now, Leon, you made a very interesting comment in your book about Facebook and the rather devious algorithms they use, which you say are designed to turn us against each other. Do you think the time has come for governments to regulate Facebook? Absolutely. I mean, I don't, I don't think we need to do that, that thing that they were trying to pass where social media platforms are legally liable for what their users post. But I think there has to be some, some sort of oversight, some sort of, I mean, it's kind of like a utility now. Having social media has become just a part of our lives. It's part of a, the fabric of, of real life now. And I think there needs to be some oversight. It, it's funny. I don't really complain too much about the loss of privacy because I figure if you, you want to keep your privacy, you can just stay off social media. But there... It does seem awfully lax. It seems like people can get away with an awfully lot, especially on X, the former Twitter. Oh my gosh, I'm off. I got off of it because it's just it's a cesspool. Um, yeah, I'm not on it anymore either. Yeah. Now you wrote that you've always felt uncomfortable using the word man to describe yourself because of all the masculine baggage that goes with the word man. Yeah. But don't you think that gay men like you and I are redefining masculinity? Uh, yeah, I think we are, actually. That's a really good point. I guess growing up, I just, I guess to call myself a man uh, meant that I was like uh, taking on or assuming all the, the kind of the negative stuff, you know, the machismo bullshit kind of thing. That was my resistance. When I was a kid, I had a shrink actually tell me that the reason I liked Wonder Woman and Bionic Woman was that I was looking for strong role models who weren't jerks, who didn't have, who weren't macho assholes. Oh, sorry, language, macho jerks. And I, yeah, I think, I think that's changing. And, you know, I think the trans community is owed a lot of credit for that because they're redefining what it means to be a man, a woman in between, neither, both. I know a lot of people are threatened by it. I'm kind of excited by how, gender is kind of evolving in my lifetime. I think it's really interesting. Well, I think people like you and I are part of that evolution. And so well, here's to us, Harvey. Yeah, here's to us. I think we're great men. Now, you've been with your husband, Lawrence, for over 30 years. You wrote that when people ask you what the secret is to your longevity as a couple, you give a lot of credit to separate closets, separate bedrooms, separate bathrooms, picking your battles, and having a selective short-term memory loss, do you think that ultimately a successful, happy relationship simply amounts to having maturity and learning how to compromise? Oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, the older I get, the more I think that's part of it. I think, I mean, picking the right person certainly is key. I was very lucky <laughs> in that regard. But so was he. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell him you said that. Yes, no, please I do. do. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wonder if you were single today, would you use any of those online dating apps? Gosh, you know, I don't know. I Grinder. I would feel kind of creepy, like walking into a restaurant and having people 
you know oh that's him he's looking and what is he like and that would be kind of strange i don't know if i were single now i do people still meet organically in classes and at museums and i was never good at flirting even back then before all of this so i don't know i guess i probably would use maybe a matchmaking service like I can't remember the names of them because I don't use them. But yeah, I, I don't think I'd use like a, an actual hookup app because that would just, I don't know. Never say never though. Who knows? I mean, who knows? Well, I doubt that you'll ever need to go on a dating app, but I will tell you that I met my partner, Steve, who's also the producer of this show on match.com seven years ago. So it, it does work. Yeah. That's, I mean, I would use one of those, you know, that seems a little more, little more it's kind of like a more of an investment as opposed to just oh i'm horny what can i find now you've been quoted as saying that a life in the arts is richly rewarding even if it doesn't reward one with riches which i think is so insightful so leon looking back over your career is there anything you would have done differently hmm you know one thing that lawrence has always told me back when we were doing old dogs and new tricks he said that if i if i had promoted myself as an actor if i worked as hard promoting myself as an actor as i worked promoting the show he thinks i would i'd be a big star i don't think that's true but i do think maybe i could have i'm from indiana i I was always the conflict with me is like being an actor and self promoting yourself while coming from this culture where it's, they think you should only be in the newspaper when you're born, when you marry, and when you die. So it was like a conflict to promote yourself, but be modest, promote you. I never really mastered bridging those two worlds. I wish I'd had. That's probably, if I have any regrets, it's that I I wasn't more full of myself at the time. <laughs> I know a lot of people be like, could, how could you have been any more full of yourself? But yeah, I wish I would have taken the promotional aspects of being an actor more seriously. I'm not good at networking or partying or schmoozing, and I wish I had been. Maybe it's not too late. Maybe I can still learn. I was just going to say that I don't think it's too late, and I think that by appearing on shows like ours, by writing these fabulous books, you are actually reinventing yourself as a very entertaining author, social commentator. I can see you having your own talk show at some point. You know, Lawrence and I have talked about it. I've had people ask me about it. I think I would need a team. I mean, look at your set. I mean, <laughs> look at my mess. I mean, if I had a team who could produce a show as well as yours is produced, I, I would consider it. But it's a lot of work, isn't it, Harvey? I mean, I don't know if I'm... But never say never. Maybe someday. It's a lot of work, but I'll tell you, it's very rewarding. And one of the reasons is because I get to meet people like you. I I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Leon Acord and buy his books, TV shows, and movies by going to his official website, leonacord.com. Well, Leon, I have only one more question for you. Are you ready? Yes, hit me. Okay, here goes. Near the end of your book, you ask this question. How do we acknowledge the bad news, the hard knocks life throws our way, yet still manage to be happy? So, Leon, have you found the answer to that question yet? You know, that's that's it's a daily challenge, I think. I don't think you ever find the answer and then you're done. I think every day is about acknowledging what's going on in the world, but still trying to find your own happiness within that. I think the thing for me is is really about keeping it small. I mean, I do, I'm kind of a news junkie, but I do, I do a gratitude list every morning for one thing. I, I journal every day. I try to look as much inward as I do outward and, and try to always be grateful for the things that I have or the things that you don't have that you realize you don't need. That's, that's can be powerful too. But yeah, it's really about, what uh, Quentin Crisp says, taking the journey to the interior, you got to find your happiness within because if you look out in the world for it, I don't know. It's a crazy world these days. Well, I got to tell you, it's been such a pleasure meeting you and having this chance to share your wit, your wisdom, your wonderful books with our audience. I have a feeling there's more books in you that are going to come I, 
Yeah, I'm just starting my next one. It's about all the crappy temp jobs I've had while I was an actor called Axes to Grind. But this one's going to actually have a, a, a purpose, a through line, a, a moral, which um, I hope people will catch on to before I have to spell it out in the last chapter. But yeah, I'm already working on it. I hope that when that book comes out, you'll do me the honor of coming back to our show to promote it. I would love that. Twist my arm. <laughs> Okay, consider your arm twisted. <laughs> and as Ruta Lee says, consider your ass kissed. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show, Leon. I loved every moment of our time together. Oh, thank you, Harvey. I really, really appreciate it. I love your show. Congratulations on your success and keep them coming. I love watching it. Thank you so, so much. Our guest has been actor, writer, and producer Leon Acord, whose new book, Expletives Not Deleted, is now available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR team, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.